Welcome to part four of our lecture series on the Constitution. This lecture deals with the kind of government the Constitution creates. Once again, we will be talking about the difference between the popular view of the Constitution and the reality behind it. More specifically, we'll talk about the idea that the United States is a democracy, why that's an inaccurate and even dangerous claim, and what a republic is all about. We'll of course cover these two types of government, their similarities, their differences, and why it's important. But in order to fully understand the issue, we also need to consider two other types of government. Monarchy and oligarchy. These four basic types will give you a full perspective and context for understanding how our government is set up and why it was set up that way. Now there are other forms of government, but with a few exceptions, most of them can be placed into one of these four categories. For example, a plutocracy is ruled by the rich. This is a form of oligarchy. In any event, we will focus on these four for purposes of this lecture. We'll start with monarchy. You're most likely familiar with this. This is when power is concentrated in a single individual, a king, a dictator, a despot, or whatever. It comes from the Greek monos, meaning one, and archos, meaning leader. So a monarchy is when there is one and only one leader. Obviously, this is the kind of government the founders rebelled against, specifically targeting most of their complaints against the monarch, King George. Oligarchy is when power is vested in an elite few. This is usually a class, a higher class, a ruling class, or whatever, so it isn't much better than a monarchy. Like the word monarchy, oligarchy has its roots in Greek, this time from the Greek oligos, meaning few. With the power concentrated in an elite few, the masses are easily subjugated. Democracy is what seems to be the popular preference for the form of government, and there's little wonder why. It's popular rule. Democracy is the rule of the majority, the will of the masses, and this would trump the will of any select few. The first part of its root, the Greek demos, is generally translated as people, but it's important to understand in what context it is meant. This isn't ruled by some people, it's ruled by most people, the majority, the masses. The telling part is the second root word, kratos, rule by strength. If that makes it sound more like mob rule, well, you're getting the idea. Majority rule is minority ruled. In essence, it's the exact opposite of an oligarchy. Whereas an oligarchy allows a select few to subjugate the many, a democracy allows the many to impose their will on minorities. So what is a republic, and how is it different from a democracy? The root of the word is Latin, but the meaning has its origins much earlier in Greek with Plato's dialogue. Here, Plato argues for his ideal form of government in opposition to other bad types, which include oligarchy and democracy. He also describes how oligarchy leads to democracy as the oppressed masses overthrow the ruling class. The Latin root here is the same as it is for the word public, publicus, meaning the population. That's different from the people in democracy. This isn't just a few people, or some people, or even most people. It's all the people, the public, the entire population, which means that no group, however large or small, can impose its will on others. To illustrate the difference between these four types of government, we can talk about the fundamental differences in their answer to one very important question. Where do our rights actually come from? In a monarchy, rights come from the ruler. Historically, this was known as the divine right of kings. Kings were granted power by God himself, and the king gave some of these rights to the people as he saw fit. He may knight someone, or grant them a claim of lordship or whatever. He could grant them, and he could take them away just as easily. In an oligarchy, it's the leaders, whomever the ruling class is, who are granted the rights, again, usually by God. Generally, the idea is that the ruling class rules by God's divine will, and so everything they do is God's will and cannot be countermanded. The evidence for this is the fact that God would not have placed them in power if he did not want them to have it, therefore, shut up and do as we say. In a democracy, the rights come from the people, and so you have whatever right society says that you do. If society says that you have the right to keep and bear arms, then you have that right until the masses change their mind and decide you don't have that right after all. This marks the fundamental difference between a democracy and a republic. A republic, at least in the form our founders created when they ratified the Constitution, recognizes that rights are inherent. Basically, you're born with them, and they're as much a part of you as your own inherent abilities. Many people, including many of our founders, said that God gave us these rights specifically. It's kind of like cutting out the middleman. Instead of God giving rights to a king or to a ruling class, they're given directly to us, each as individuals. 
Others, including other founders, say that the rights just come from nature. But whether they come from nature, God, or the flying spaghetti monster is irrelevant. The Constitution makes no claim as to where these rights come from, merely that you have them. This is why the Constitution says that a particular right shall not be infringed or shall not be violated, instead of, this right is hereby granted. The Constitution does not grant rights. It merely protects them. The fact of the United States being a republic is mentioned in Article 4, Section 4, where it requires the United States to guarantee to every single state a republican form of government. Relax, this doesn't mean you have to vote Republican. It means that the United States will not allow any group, not even a majority, to infringe on the rights of the people. But while the Constitution has nothing to say about democracy, the Founders certainly did. For example, in Federalist Number 10, James Madison says, Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property. A republic promises the cure for which we are seeking. For another example, Alexander Hamilton said, It has been observed that a pure democracy would be the most perfect government. Experience has proved that no position is more false than this. The ancient democracies in which the people themselves deliberated never possessed one good feature of government. Their very character was tyranny, their figure deformity. There are many other such examples. Our founders simply did not want a democracy. So how did they envision this republic? The original First Amendment in the Bill of Rights, which was proposed by Congress but never ratified, specifies how to figure out how many representatives to have per population size. You couldn't have too few or too many. Now why would this be in the Bill of Rights? Madison, along with the rest of Congress, is trying to avoid both democracy and oligarchy. Basically, if you have too few representatives, you have an oligarchy, and the country is run by the elite, the special interests. Too many, and you get democracy, mob rule, people voting themselves largesse from the treasury. A republic was seen as being the sweet spot in the middle, where there were enough representatives to make the elite ineffective, but not so many that the mob took over. If we were to follow this formula today, we'd have over 1,500 members of Congress. Instead, we have 435. By Madison's mathematics, that makes this an oligarchy, a system beholden to powerful lobbies and special interest groups. Looking around, it's hard to disagree. So let's go over the fundamental differences between a democracy and a republic. In a democracy, rights come from the people or from society. Really what that means is that you can do whatever everyone else allows you to do. Your rights can change with their whim. So if, after a terrorist attack, everyone agrees that being safe is more important than your right to be secure from warrantless searches, then your right, according to this philosophy, goes away, and you have no recourse for asserting it. Whereas in our constitutional republic, rights are considered to be inherent, and regardless of how everyone else feels about your right to be secure in your home, you can still assert it and seek redress if it is violated. In a democracy, since rights come from the people, it falls to the government to say what rights people do and do not have. The duly elected representatives of the people can act with their authority and essentially claim whatever they want. But under the Constitution, rights are protected. Since they are considered to be an inherent part of your existence, no authority whatsoever can claim legitimacy in any act infringing on your rights. In a democracy, rights are privileges, and your rights are limited to whatever your fellow countrymen agree should be your rights. They can be taken away at any time. But in our republic, rights are inalienable. They cannot be separated from you, and so they cannot be taken away, only violated. As such, it is the government that is limited, not your rights. In a democracy, power is centralized, being in whatever majority who chose the current government. The majority chooses the government, and the government serves at their whim. But in our republic, we have a decentralized system of checks and balances. The method of choosing congressmen, senators, and the president isn't mob rule. It's spread out all over the country. This is why the president is elected by electors chosen by the states, instead of directly by a majority of all Americans. Also, the branches of government are supposed to put checks against each other to prevent a usurpation of unconstitutional power. Now, the big criticism to all of this is that all of the aspects of a republic I have just described are incorporated into the modern idea of democracy, not the old idea of majority rule. So that brings up the question, what if we have a republic and just call it a democracy? Both democracy and republic have been misused by many countries claiming these titles where neither applied. 
Why not just have everyone understand that democracy means republic, not majority rule? Quite simply because people don't understand it. As we speak, there are those trying to eliminate the Electoral College because they think we're a democracy where the people determine the government. There are people seeking to eliminate the rights protected by the Second and Fourth Amendments and others for exactly the same reason. All justified by the fact that we're a democracy. As my grandma used to say, you can call a dog a cat all you want, but it still won't purr. So now you understand why we use the word republic to refer to our country, and why using democracy is not only invalid, it is downright dangerous to our liberties. From this point on, I think you'll find that if you pay attention, you'll see a lot of politicians and pundits appealing to democracy to get whatever they want passed, and usually it'll be something that shouldn't be passed at all. Until next time, stay strong and be free.